Okay. Let's see, it's live on Facebook. Hi, all. Live, live, live. On the reading? Yeah. Maybe there's only like five people watching. <laughs> nah, it can be. Fahrenheit is, is the it, biggest section. Is it five of us? <laughs> okay, we are live already. Shall, shall we start? Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jacinta, and welcome back to Online with the Pros, uh, an initiative organized by Band Director Singapore. Uh, so for this session, we are very fortunate to have four very outstanding clarinetists. Hi, everyone. Uh, so in a right. few minutes' time, we'll be, they will be sharing a, a lot of useful pointers and tips on how to be a better clarinet player. And, uh, but before we go to the main topics, maybe I'll just ask them to introduce, do some brief introduction of themselves. So can we start with maybe Desmond, Mr. Desmond Chow? Okay, hi, I'm Desmond here. Uh, I started playing the clarinet at age, was it 13? Secondary one. I was in St. Patrick's School. And after I graduated, uh, I started formal lessons with my first teacher, uh, Mao Yue, from the SSO, the current principal. And then about, was it two years or one year later, he passed me on to Tang Xiaoping, the principal bass clarinetist. And I've been with him for the longest time. I do not know. Can't remember. Very long. Uh. Throughout my studies, I was, I was uh, studying with him. And I graduated from Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts with a bachelor's in clarinet performance. And after that, I was just teaching and freelancing. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, I, I never went overseas. Yeah. Oh. So true blue Singapore. Yes, proud of it. <laughs> Yay. Uh, maybe next we can have Mr. Daniel Yao. I am Daniel. Um, I started also in the band when I was in secondary school, but I was actually a tuba player for four years. Right. Yeah. So... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you made, you well, made I, I made a good switch, yes. <laughs> so, Best um, decision I, ever. <laughs> So I bought a plastic clarinet when I was sec 2 and then I just dabbled on the clarinet and then I also found a community van, Audio Image AI, where I actually met Desmond there and yeah. he, he was basically my first clarinet mentor. Yeah, after that, after secondary school, I went to NAFA as well, but halfway through I dropped out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so after that I went to the army. And I was in a combat unit for one and a half years, and then I was quite directionless at that time. So I decided to sign on with the SAF band, where I was there for four and a half years. And yeah, after that, I sort of wanted to do a career switch in a way. So I took a year off, and then I went to study wind band conducting in Amsterdam, both my bachelor's and master's. And after that, I decided to come back here. So I've been back in Singapore since 2018. Yeah, so I've been tutoring clarinets, woodwinds, and also taking some full bands here and there. And yeah, while I was in Amsterdam, I also minored in bass clarinet. So I'm, I'm an advocate for auxiliary clarinets. Yeah, so bass clarinets, auto clarinets, contra bass clarinets, whatever. Yeah, so... We'll talk about that later, and yeah, and I'm also a clarinetist in a mixed instrumental ensemble, Cole, where there's four straight, pretty strange instruments, yeah, and yeah, so we'll talk about more later. I'll leave the time mm. for the rest. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, next, Mr. Ralph Lin. Sorry. My name is Ralph. Uh, just like Desmond, I studied the clarinet since 13 years old. It's in Pets military band. Uh, just like Desmond, I went over to NAFA. Yeah, kind of followed his footsteps. Um, uh, been st I, I was actually uh, under Desmond. Uh, he was my first uh, teacher uh, who, who taught me clarinet when I was uh, preparing for NAFA. Sec 4, Sec 5, and then yeah, I went to NAFA. Uh, after that, I... I, I went over to uh, Tang Xiaoping, and uh, he's been my teacher ever since then. Um, after that, I went to bachelor's uh, with the NAFA RCM program, 
and then I've had um, opportunities to have uh, master class to, to to learn with teachers there, attend master classes there. So yeah. Um, also, a very big advocate for the clarinet family. <laughs> I formed my own clarinet ensemble like a, a decade ago. Uh, clarinet. Mm. Uh, mm. Like and subscribe. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, um, my, my, my main, my main um, I really push for clarinet ensembles and uh, that's why I formed clarinet. And yeah, mm. I'm a bit awkward, as you can see. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. You have you have your hands up yeah. on people. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been I've been uh, primarily teaching clarinet, uh, uh, woodwind ensemble, and then junior bands as well. Yeah. But my main my heart still lies with clarinet, with music in general actually. But clarinet's my voice. So yeah. All right. That's it for me. Thank you, Ralph. And lastly, we have um, Mr. David Quick. Hi, uh, my name is David, and um, just like most of us here, I, I started the clarinet when I was 13 in a secondary school band. So <laughs> I was from Woodland Springs Secondary School Band. Um, yeah, I'm so very proud of, of, of where I come from. Fun <laughs> fact, <laughs> <laughs> I never wanted to play the clarinet. Uh, I was kind of thrown into there because we were lacking instruments, lacking players. So I got dumped there, I got dumped there probably because I wanted to play the, the saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> really? Right, right. <laughs> and uh, I well I got put there and uh, I had a I had a senior, his name is Zohafis, who also went to Nafa and um, I kinda followed his footsteps. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So after after my secondary school I went to Nafa. Uh, oh sorry, before that I was studying with a teacher. His name was Mr. Eng Hock On. And if I'm not wrong, he was a he was a, a SAF band clarinetist. Yeah. So after that, I, I had lessons with him for maybe what, two months, I think. And then I, I I went to Nafa and I started lessons with uh, Mr. Tang Xiaoping. And then uh, same as Ralph, I took the the Nafa RCM program. And so I also went to London for for seven weeks and I had lessons and master classes over over there in London. And then um, I'm I'm the freshest. <laughs> sorry to say, I'm the freshest graduate here. <laughs> I graduated. Uh, was that, was fact, that an important point, though? <laughs> 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 to 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 rub in our age, was that a very important point? It's not. It's not a bad thing, right? <laughs> um, so I graduated actually last year, uh, last year uh, August twenty nineteen, and uh, I've just been, I've just been teaching around privately uh, in government schools and also some part time in uh, Nafa, and uh, yeah, that's about yeah. So I I played. Well, I play more on uh, e flat, B flat clarinet and the bass. E flat, mm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> e flat. <laughs> yep, that, that's it for me. Thank you for all the introduction, guys. It, it seems like all four of you are products of NAFA and. <laughs> and <laughs> Hashtag no sports. Good products. <laughs> <laughs> oops, oops. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, and, but um, yeah, yeah. We we all have a, a similar trait. It all came from Nafa, I guess. You could see that. Mm -hmm. And and from the intro introductions, I know who is the oldest here now. Right, right, Desmond, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway, we we have quite a number of questions and topics to cover today. So let's dive right in. Now, or else we will not have enough time. Mm. Um. So the first topic that maybe we can talk about is the clarinet like the instrument and equipment itself so uh, i remember when uh, just like one week ago we had our own discussion on what topics to, to share for today's session uh some of you not to mention names uh told me about you know some you have some students switching parts mix and match the clarinet you know like we still yeah, see such mine. cases going on <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I thought it's important like, to share this very fundamental issue. So maybe we should start with how to set up a clarinet, the do's and the don'ts. Mm -hmm. Anyone would like to, you know, share? Uh, shall I begin then? The Desmond? Sure. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, sure, sure. David, David, go. Uh, sure, David, David. So, um... the, the youngest. <laughs> For a number of years, I've been setting up in a way where I just I learned from my senior, so it's basically just grabbing any part and just 
smashing it together. And I'm hoping it will it will go in, you know. And then I had my instrument badly damaged once, and uh, I learned a very valuable lesson on how to set up. So, clearly, um, I have my A clarinet here on standby, so I can show you what what it's like. Now, um, so one 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 method I always teach my students is that your palm is always holding the back side of the clarinet. Okay, your palm is always holding the back side. This, what is the back side? The back side <laughs> is okay. the part that's oh. facing. <laughs> oh, okay. So you, always, you always hold it by the, 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 the body, not the by back the back side. Key. The back side. Okay, so if I take my bell out, yeah, so just a very, very quick uh, sum, summary. So the back side, the hand touch the back side, yeah, and then the bell. We always start from the bottom going up. Yeah, so, so one hand the bell, one hand of the lower joint. And instead of mashing it in together, the action is actually a, a twist. Clockwise and anti-clockwise. I don't know which one is which, okay, but you get what I mean. It's always opposite. It's always opposite. So you allow the, the, the parts to slide in very smoothly. Yeah, okay. And then the second one. This is the most awkward one. Why? Because the upper joint has a lot of keys in front. A lot of keys. So again, the palm touching the backside. And then the keys actually, I mean the fingers wrap around the keys. Only these two, only these these three keys. Because uh, we don't want to bend any of the side keys. So this way, my hands are quite big. So I need to stick out my pinky. Okay, but those with smaller hands, uh, it should be just it should be just nice. Okay, so you see I'm avoiding this whole area. I'm avoiding the octave key. Yeah, I'm all my pressure is on the back side and these two. Uh, keys okay and again same thing yeah i hold my lower joint and bell by the bell okay so i don't bend any keys and i okay and one more thing by pressing the two keys you actually raise the bridge you raise the bridge and that's what we want okay if not you'll be tearing off the felt or the the cork that is over there uh, and same thing the action is the same yeah it's anti-clockwise and clockwise okay and you may have and you have to make sure that the bridge lines up okay not you affect the, the how the how the keys close the la and lastly the rest is pretty simple you hold the upper joint the same way and the bell goes in twist yeah twist not jam it down uh, twist barrel you mean hey did i say what did i say <laughs> bell. <laughs> bell. <laughs> bell. <laughs> barrel, barrel. and the uh, and lastly the bell key the same the same way uh so for setting up uh, there, I, I find that there are actually two ways to set up. I think I had a discussion on this recently. Um, there's one way is to put the ligature first, followed by the mouthpiece. Another way is to put the hey, what am I talking about? Ligature first, followed by the, the reed. reed. The Sorry. reed. <laughs> ligature first, followed by the reed. My way is the reed first, followed by a ligature. Reason being, my ligature is actually metal. My ligature is actually made of metal. Uh, same goes for the Silverstein. Uvers. Yeah, the silver stein is very prone to scratching. The bars are very sharp. Uh, speaking from experience. So uh, that's why I always put my reed first because we want to keep we want to keep this surface uh, as unscratched as possible. So yep. if you put your ligature, you know, it starts to roll around and scratch, 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 and then you're you know you have problems. So I put the reed first actually. And then very slowly and carefully ligature over. For those using leather ligatures, uh, it's not much of a problem because the leather will not scratch the, the mouthpiece. So that's, uh, well, that's how I set up safely and properly, I guess. Yeah. Actually, can I expand on David? So I also, I also set up the same way. Um, to avoid chipping the reed, I will put the metal part of the ligature on the reed first and <laughs> it will go in. If you, if you go in from the top, you know, you, you run the risk of doing that. So it kind of pivots against the reed, like this, and in. Also, it should be below the line. Uh, just very, very rough gauge, just below the line. And so that's how I set up. Uh, one more thing about the bridge. A lot of students, we make this mistake. When we are setting up, we don't, we shouldn't be like turning a lot. When you turn a lot, if you look, I turn a lot here. This keys, my keys are going to clash are going to crash mm. with these keys over here. And a, a lot of clarinets yeah. I see, the keys here are bent. It is because we turn, we overturn here. So just be very careful when you are setting those up, yeah? Okay. Sure. I also like to ask a question to everybody. You, often you see students put a lot, 
a long time of the read in your mouth before setting up. <laughs> so would we like to just to debunk the this read. Yeah, <laughs> to everybody? That's a very good point. Um, first, I, I don't know where it came from, but they said suck the read. Let's not <laughs> suck the read. Let's just moist the read. Okay, f just moist it. For me, uh, personally for me, no more than like f five seconds. In fact, I'm, I'm just like three mm. seconds. Depending if when you play and the sound is not, uh, you don't like the sound, then you, you, you leave it on a bit longer. La. But you shouldn't be putting it as you set up the clarinet. It's yeah. way too long. Mm. Uh, so maybe, maybe the others can give your suggestions. For me personally, if I have, if I have a, a bottle of water, I will dip it into water. I'll just dip it in and pull it out, wipe off the excess, and then I'll put it on. I try not to use saliva somehow, just <laughs> for hygiene. Yeah. Actually, ideally, we should all be doing what Desmond does, but I'm... Uh, <laughs> <a> bit... <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, hygiene is important. For, for, for convenience, like, that's for convenience. For yeah, convenience, but yeah. especially this period, hygiene is mm. yes, yeah. the most important now. Yeah. Thanks, Desmond. Thanks, no guys. Pro, no pro. Uh, what about some maybe basic maintenance? You no know, students can can do at home because I, I understand that the body of the 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 clarinet like the wood right needs a lot of care a lot of special care like the, even the keys maybe like y'all can share some pointers on that actually be before we go into the maintenance could we talk about like the mm. placement of the reed mm. okay yes I, I think that's one point yeah, sure, sure. yeah I noticed that like some students tend to put it too high or too low yeah, so mm. I guess it's a preference thing, okay? Like for me personally, I tend to put it a little higher, but not past the tip, never past the tip, okay? And and some some other people would tend to put it much lower down. But I think the best for everyone is to try, and then you mm -hmm. experiment what works best for you, what gives you the best response. Generally, yeah. if you want the read to play a little stronger, then you push the read higher. I put it up like that. If you want it to be slightly lighter, then you bring it down past the tip. Uh, I mean, lower down the tip. Yeah. Just make sure when you turn it opposite, you can't see the tip of the read. That's definitely too high, oh. I guess. Yeah. You mean, Unless you mean you, the tip of the mouthpiece? Uh, as in, as in example, huh? as in yeah. some students tend to put it like that. I don't know if you can see it. Then oh, the read okay. yeah, sticks yeah, up. See. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a bit, it's a bit that's too high. Too high and, right? Yeah, that's too high, and okay. sometimes it, it ends up cutting your tongue, so you have to be careful. Yeah. Mm. So that's... yeah, so for me also in general, like this is the mouthpiece and this is the reed, like they should be flush. So like even the bottom, mm. you should check the mm. top and the bottom that they are really straight together, like it shouldn't be sticking out or whatever. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and then you can. Up uh, once the tip is there, then you can check whether it's too hard or too soft for the day. Yeah, sorry, okay. David. Okay, so this is a, a very good example of what not to do. Yeah, because I as I as I took out my mouthpiece, my read shifted very slightly. So as you can see, the lines are not very parallel. Mm. You can see he it, uh, is a bit leaning towards here more. So you gotta be very careful, especially when you are seasoning new reads, because you're essentially you're actually training teaching the read to vibrate in a slanted angle. Mm. So you Ensure that the read is really get on before you you actually play it. Yeah, yeah. That's mm. that's. Oh, uh, and one more thing. Uh, with regards to mouthpiece, because well, we often forget that the mouthpiece is as as important as the read. So a lot of times, I see a lot of mouthpieces that are very chipped because of careless mm. around and and you know knocking here and there, and the mouthpiece cap goes. You bash the mouthpiece cap onto the tip. The tip actually chips off, or it is it has lines on it. So mm. there's no other way to put this. Just be very careful with the tip, <laughs> because once it's gone, it's gone. Personally, for me, when I when I'm moving, when I'm let's say I want to go and wash my mouthpiece, I actually hold the mouthpiece by the tip with my fingers, so I don't bump it into any my wall or my sink or my tap. Just personally for my, my on my end. Yeah. yeah, and if you play for a long time, there will also be like white stuff building up yeah, yeah, yeah. on the mouthpiece <laughs> so maybe, maybe. if possible please try to get rid of it and wash your mouthpieces 
Just with like lukewarm water once in a while. You don't have to do it all the time. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here. It says, uh, can we play the sound if the read is too low and too high? So uh, if you push uh, the read too high, uh, basically it becomes too hard. And um, we, get, we get an airy sound, uh, basically. It's simply because, you know, you're playing, you're playing a read that's too hard for your current setup. Uh, if you play it too low, uh, okay, just, just to expand on placing it too low, I wouldn't place it past uh, until the hole is exposed. The moment you expose the hole, it's, it's too low already and you're just going to get funny sounds. But right at the bottom, I don't know, I, I've actually never really played at this angle before. I'm not sure how this is going to sound <laughs> like, so this is going to be a surprise to me and to everyone. Yeah, you can hear the sound, it starts like, you know, this, this nasal sound, it's, it's just, you know, not ideal. The, the best sound is the one that's in the middle. Uh, middle meaning whichever position uh, best suits you as a player. Mm. Thank you for addressing okay. this question by Miss Liang Jia Yi. She's another very pro clarinetist, Desmond's wife. <laughs> Hi, Jia Yi. <laughs> Wait, sorry, I also need okay. to add on to the ligature. Like, mm. most of the time, it's too loose mm -hmm. on a lot of students. Mm. So, you just need to turn to the point where it stops turning, and that will be okay. If you can still turn, that means it's too loose. Yeah. And sorry, we're being really particular with the setup because this is essentially the only way to produce the sound on the clarinet. So yeah. this really needs to be set up right. If not, you already lost the battle. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And and I think along the way, uh, you all did mention about some basic maintenance, but like some uh, like like washing the mouthpiece. Mm. Uh, no, like with warm water or no, once in a while. Are there any more useful tips for maintenance? Have a cloth and just cloth. wipe down. Yeah. If, like, if you're wearing glasses, you can just use the spectacle cloth. Mm. Mm -hmm. Not get a microfiber cloth and you just wipe. You don't have the polish. Don't always use your silver polish cloth because the silver polish cloth will actually wipe away the polish on your instruments yeah you can use it maybe once a year as a good maintenance or before syf yeah but normally <laughs> you can just, yeah. just just clean because some of you have sweaty palms and it will oxidize the keys yeah i'm quite lucky i don't have sweaty palms but also it's good to just clean yeah uh one more tip is that uh, many of us we swap our instruments let's say after a band rehearsal and we are panicking because bad drum major is going to give us punishment already we often forget <laughs> we often forget the water that's still inside the grooves yeah mm. we often forget the water that's still see because I just played so I have water in my grooves so, so, and, and especially if your, if your body is made out of wood it's very well it's not for the wood so we just take a cloth a swap yeah, we put our oops, we put our, our put our finger like this, and we just clean the water out. Clean it at the edge. Yeah. Mm. So you feel the yeah, you feel the edge, and then your, your cloth will get. Well, you see the water on your cloth. Yeah. You. Yeah, and also sometimes we have water stuck in our keys. Mm. You can either blow it out, or what I use is a really cheap option. I go to Daiso, and buy the coffee filter paper. It's two dollars for like two hundred sheets, and then you just put it in between. Yeah, to and you can buy one for your whole section for the whole year. With just yeah, good dollars. idea. Yeah, oh, yeah uh, just to just sorry. maintenance. Um, okay, I'll go first. The yeah. rings, you want to make sure you clean the rings. Yeah. Um, I, I use Q-tips. Maybe you you can uh, combine it with cloth or what. But the rings are really very filthy as well as the tone holes, mm. it's very important to go and, you know, clean those with Q-tips or cloth or whatever. Yeah, Desmond, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, just to add on to, like, what David was saying about rushing, right, just to clean your clarinet, sometimes we, we swap our instruments and we swap it really fast, like, just pull it out. What that does, after a long period of playing, all the moisture is built up in there, right? Once you pull the swap, it doesn't really absorb all the moisture. 
In fact, it pushes all the water into various tone holes. So that's what you, 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 are, you want to try to avoid. So when you swap your instruments, no matter how rushed you are, try to do it slowly. Just make sure that every section is, uh, of the moisture is being absorbed. Yeah, and do it one or two times. That should be fine. Never pull it out straight, like really quick. Yeah, and please make sure the cloth is open up as well yeah. before you pull through. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we have many, a... many hey, horror, we... horror cases. There is a... Sorry, sorry. Uh, last sorry. Uh, so... mm. Yeah. There's a question uh, about, okay, about the, the cloth. <laughs> Uh, the, the question the question later uh when you're pulling a sword slowly the moment you feel it stuck right stop stop immediately don't pull it any harder if you feel like it's stuck you've never felt that sensation before stop chances are the claw the swap might get stuck so uh what should you do you should ask your band director ask someone who I guess band director is still better than your section mates because um, the first thing yeah. that we'll do is if it's stuck is to pull harder and the moment you pull it harder it's going to get stuck and then when you eventually bring it to the technician it's going to get even harder to remove so the moment it's stuck stop open the other joints and see whether you can pull it out from the other side if you can if you can't ask someone who has knowledge your band director your section tutor uh, yeah just ask someone stop already just leave it there uh, yeah okay speak to everyone for interrupting everyone <laughs> uh, who wants to continue okay. Okay, uh, maybe we can address, since we are on this topic, uh, Mr. Denver Wong asked a question on Facebook. Uh, this question is addressed to Mr. Quack. Can you explain why we don't swap our mouthpiece? Yeah, uh, I want to say this just now. Uh, we don't swap our mouthpiece mm. because our mouthpiece chamber is actually very unique. It's, uh, because, of course, it is, it is built and it is finished by, by, by a craftsman in wherever your mouthpiece is made. So the chamber is essentially this is your voice box, so um, you need to protect it. You can't have any. You can't. You you've got to avoid scratches, any form of uh, erosion or all that. So by using a cloth to constantly pull through, pull through, pull through, you're going to start to get the erosion from the from the cloth. Or let's say in band, you drop your cloth on the floor, then the floor is sandy, dirty, has all the little pegs. You pull through a mouthpiece, there's going to be a huge line, lines in your mouthpiece. So personally, um, okay, this, this might be quite unhygienic, but I, I only keep my mouthpiece to myself. I, I don't ever swap my mouthpiece. The most I do is I just rinse it through water and I leave it out to dry. So the water evaporates. Mm. Like, yeah, so I have never ever, you know, pulled through my mouthpiece. And I think uh, it's same for base mouthpiece, even mouthpieces. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anything else to add, guys? No, let's move on. No? Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay, yes, let's move on. <laughs> so we have a lot of questions on tuning and intonation. So maybe we can start by how do we tune a clarinet? Because we have so many parts, like how you all demonstrated just now, the fixing of clarinet. So maybe we can just talk about that first. The base, the tuning advice. Um... Sorry, that's when you want to start. You want to start with this? Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, so generally, what I tell my students is to tune the open G first. Open G, just play it and check or check with the tuner, and then you pull out the barrel for this. Try not to pull out so much if you are extremely sharp. Wait and then check your tuning C, the middle C that you play. If it's also sharp, pull out the middle. Then from there you can gauge how much to pull out here, how much to pull out there, but End of the day, if mm. it's really too sharp, okay, we have to consider using a longer barrel or, or something else, or mouthpiece, yeah. Uh, actually, we should try and change the mouthpiece first um, because I think not many schools are accessible to a, a longer barrel. So mm. normally, try changing a different mouthpiece. If not, try changing the body, uh, try changing yep. the instrument, like try a yeah. different instrument. Maybe it's just that yeah. instrument. Yeah. yeah. Uh, don't change bodies, I uh, don't... <laughs> Yes, please don't change the body. Don't change and you can, if your instrument is broken. Yeah. And you can actually yeah, check yeah. that there's usually a serial number here and here. So they should match. They should be the same number. Yeah. Mm. But actually I have a differing opinion. For me, it's the middle <laughs> joint is always in. Yes, please don't change the body. Don't change the body. 
Yeah, so I don't ever use the middle joint. Yeah, I will ed it might be controversial to the rest of you, but <laughs> this is what I advocate. Never pull out the middle. Only the barrel and the bell. Yeah. I, I used to be with uh, Daniel as well because I like to believe that the clarinet was um, built to have this key and this key this distance apart as well as this distance apart as well as that distance, distance apart. Um, but then uh, I went to try my own tuning and if I pull this out, and this is personal of course, everyone, mm. you all, mm. you guys, you have to do this yourself. It works for me this yeah. way, it works for Desmond that way. Daniel, it works for Daniel when he pulls out just there, yeah. but different people have different tuning. You have to try it. Uh, so like I said, I used to believe in the blueprint, but then I realized that my high notes were very sharp. And so when I pulled this out, I found that my tuning was, my tuning for the high notes went better. The low notes weren't affected so much. And for me, my sound remained the same. Most importantly for me is sound. And uh, yeah, the, 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 if we pull this out, the downside about pulling this out is that it is very easy to slip back in. And so you have to check that it is always out. There are, there, are, there are accessories where you can put rings on there, but I, I myself don't have it. I just make sure that's always out. So yeah, that's, mm. that's my point on tuning. So, sorry if I may chime in a bit. Um, this is something I went through personally. My intonation was actually quite all over the place. And of course, that's because of me and of course the instrument also. So what I did in school was I took a tuner and I, I, I used mm. only the, the tuner function. So there is no drone, there is no sound. I am the one making the sound. So I sit there, mm. I play every every note of the chromatic scale comfortably and uh, in a mezzo forte. So you're not playing too loud, you're not playing too soft. So I close my eyes, I play, and then I look. So once I, once I open my eyes, the needle is, let's say, 15 cents sharp. I'm going to write, example, uh, Clarion B, 15 cents sharp. Then next note, next note, next note. So I start to create a journal or like a, a, a log of the tendencies of my instrument. And then I start to, with the information, I start to think, okay, should I pull out my middle joint because my, my Clarion G is sharp? Or should I, should I keep my barrel in? So personally, my Clarion B and C are quite, sh quite sharp. So I pull out my bell quite slightly. Uh, same goes for my, my Clarion G and F. So I also open up my middle joint very slightly. My barrel is usually in most of the time. That's mm. something you try at mm -hmm. home. Yeah, I think uh, we all, all four of us have different ways to tune our instrument, but when we play together, it works. And that's yeah. most important. Yeah. You have to find out what's, what works best for you. And use your ears, yeah. not your machines. Yep. <laughs> not your yeah. machines. You can use the machines Don't to check your tendencies. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay, so we have some questions about the E-flat clarinet from Nicole mm. and Rowan. So mm -hmm. the most issues people have is with the tuning. And I think for E flat, when you play, firstly, you need to know the instrument's tendency. And the E flat is the most cruel with regards to that. Yeah, every instrument plays different, even if it's the same model of the same brand. So you need to know the tendencies of the instruments. And for E flat, it's very important to know a lot of alternate fingerings especially for the high notes because often we are playing with flutes and piccolos so you need to <clears throat> like for the high b on the e flat you can there's a lot of things that you can add and you need to find out a lot of the alternate fingerings will not work on the b flat but it works perfectly on the e flat and yeah you really have to practice a lot on the e flat to know because after a while, your ambusher will give way as well because you're really tired and you need to push a lot. So, and if you have to tune with the piccolo, the piccolo always wins. So just follow the piccolo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's best to sit right next to each other so they can listen to one another. It shouldn't be, oh, I avoid the piccolo player so I sit as far as we can and then the intonation just goes off. It's very important to hear each other and really try to match. Also, it's about the tone color. So, yeah, whoever that you're playing with, either the first clarinets or the saxophones, soprano saxophones, piccolo, or even the trumpets. So you just have to try to match the color and that's the most important for intonation. Yeah, because often it's not about the tuning of the instrument, but it's about the tone color and 
often we hear a lot of terrible E flat clarinet sounds in like not so high level bands. Yeah, and that's a pity. Yeah, just practice and you'll get better. Trust me. And you have to have a really thick skin. <laughs> actually, actually, yes. Um, the moment you play an E flat clarinet and and you're shy about it, that's gonna work against you. Your tuning will go all over mm. the place. You need to have character to play E flat, but in order to build a character, you must dare to play. <laughs> so, uh, uh, finding a good character as well, you know, it matches that. Uh, yeah. yeah. There was this question about using B flat reads on for E flat setup, and as opposed to E flat reads. What do y'all think about them? Nah. <laughs> for me, no. no. Yeah, also yeah. for me, e no. My, my, e my e preference flat. is to use E-flat read. E-flat, yeah. E-flat. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't cut the read to... Cut the B-flat read to fit onto the E-flat mouthpiece. Yeah. yeah. I mean, not saying that I've never done it because I just forgot my E-flat read one day and so a, a B-flat read had to sacrifice. Uh, so it is possible. But I only use it in an emergency setting. Mm. Yeah, uh, because like I do have a cover of a B flat, and this is the E flat. You can see that they're sim mm. it's still quite different in the way they're shaped. Mm. It's wider. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. stick to the reads that were made for the original instruments. Mm. Try mm. them and see if it works for you. I, I, there are people that do it right, and, and yeah, and it works really well for them. Yeah. So yeah, it's up yeah. to your preference. Mm. Yeah, also some of you have questions of like synthetic reads. I'm an advocate mm. of cane reads, but if you can find really good pieces of synthetic reads, go ahead. Yeah, as long as it works. And just please not only have one piece, you need to have four or five pieces. Don't just play on one synthetic read for the whole year. The plastic mm. will wear off eventually. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, uh... Questions? With, um, yes, with, sorry. Yeah. No, no, should we address them? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, so I have one question on tuning by Mr. Tei Kai Zi. I think a lot of you know, know him. I Very good old boys. <laughs> 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 so he asks, what can you do with sharp chop notes? Oh, Any of you guys want to address this? <laughs> uh, well, the, well the, first, the first thing is... Um, yeah, a lot of reasons why the, the tones will be sharp. First things first is we this is something that we all learn uh, in, in school is when you play throat tones like your G, your A, your B flat, we want to keep the right hand down. We want to close the right hand because um, first things first, it lowers the pitch. Second thing, it encourages the sound to travel throughout the entire instrument because the tube, is, the tube gets too short over here. So you want to lengthen the tube. So we put the fingers down. Second thing, or the, the, the other reason why it could be sharp is probably because the students start to pinch the reed. Because the throat tones, mm. uh, they don't require as much uh, air because they are actually quite easy blowing. But so, so in order to, 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 to compensate for the lack of air, the students start to bite in an effort to make sound. So if I can show you. So I, I pinch mm. the reed. Actually, the, the intonation goes up. So uh, one way I would teach my students is to encourage them to keep this jaw down. Because the, the to play the clarinet you is all about actually it's the is the air. The air that is the air that controls the sound, not really the jaw. The jaw doesn't really move. So um also so I would I would suggest right hand down, um air. Just put in the air. Use the air to play the note. And if it's really too 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 sharp, then of course you have to extend the barrel very slightly. And also, like and what you said, it could be an issue of tone color among the section. Mm. Sorry, and also, wrong. when you're playing the open, the throat tones, you're only using this much tubing. So, compared to the rest where you cover more keys and to bring the air and the resonance down, you can also try to help by adding more keys. Mm. So, you force the air to put, go towards the belt. <laughs> You see, it changes whatever you add. So mm. it, it will also change your resonance and your intonation. Uh, so for all the throat tones, yeah, so you can just play around and see what is the best tone quality for you and the intonation. Okay, um, and 
like what David mentioned just now, that there are a lot of other factors that will affect tuning, like on brochure and you know, how you place the, the, the read and all. Maybe um, we can talk about on brochure now. Like we have question asked, what is considered as a good on brochure or correct on brochure? Because from what I know, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very, it differs from pe- person to person because of the different Rush, mouth no. shape and, and, and stuff like that. Do, do you want to do you guys want to talk more about this um anyone <laughs> I, I guess yeah, it's rough? always very oh, sorry, very subjective I'm for sure like mm, uh, yes. when I was in secondary school uh we chanced upon this book I won't mention what what book it is but we read through and what it taught us was to think of a think of yourself uh, sucking on a lemon then you get this like kind of face <laughs> so it forms this you pull you basically you pull back your cheeks so that and then you blow yeah but later on when i went yeah. to study with a teacher uh he corrected that in in fact yeah i was told to think more like you're whistling and bring the corners of the cheeks inwards so it, it's it's quite even all around. Instead of just you know having the pressure of the mouth from the top and the bottom, this also creates mm-hmm. a lot of pressure on the reed. So you tend to play very sharp like that. But when when it's like a whistling embouchure, yeah, basically it's it's spread around, and you get a rounder, fuller tone. And somehow I find that I could I could play longer. So it's not so tiring as compared to squeezing it down. Like that. Mm, mm. Yeah. Mm, mm. Uh, so if I may chime in, um, so generally what I would say is we need the O shape, as Desmond said, the O shape, but we also need the flat chin. We need the flat chin. The flat chin is very important because if the, the, the basically the chin or the lower jaw is where the reed is going to balance on to vibrate. So if you don't have the flat chin, this gets very mushy. And it's, it's like, you know, you're trying to stand still on a very, on a bouncy castle. You know, it's going to be very, it's going to be very bouncy. And, th- and therefore, the sound will be flat. The tone will be very loose. Example. You get a very loose tone because the lips is very mushy. So you want to keep the flat chin. And you want to keep the cheeks in as well. Like really, the cheeks in. My teacher used to scold me and say, why are you puffing your cheeks? I said, no, it's just my skin. Am I chubby? <laughs> <laughs> then after that, I realized he actually, he actually means you have to actually make a conscious effort to keep the cheeks in, to allow the air to flow immediately into the, into the mouthpiece. Yeah, so all, all keep and the flat chin, I think is very important for a good embouchure. But also keeping oh. in mind, with a flat chin, try not to strain it too much. And then yeah. you have a lot of tension. Just yeah, be you natural. just want to have the flat chin, that's it. Yeah. And even if you have braces, you can still play the clarinet. You just have to adjust. Yeah, because I think David, you had braces before, yep. right? Yeah. 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 A lot of cuts, a lot of pain, but uh, you know the, the skin the skin still around the mouth. Possible. Yeah. yeah. It's still very possible. Yep. Okay, and another question to ask is uh does the embouchure differs when you're playing the B flat clarinet and the bass clarinet? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, short answer is yes. And we assume, oh, because it's a bass clarinet, E flat clarinet, if I'm a B flat clarinetist, I can play them. The answer... That is the, that is the most co- misguided perception, yeah, right? That's the yeah. biggest misconception. And to mm. all the band directors out there, please do not send your worst players to play the bass clarinet <laughs> which often which is which is seen a lot in a lot of the bands and it doesn't help them firstly and it doesn't help you as a band director to have a bad bass clarinet this messing mm. up in the band yeah so for me the bass clarinet e flat clarinet all the auxiliary clarinets they are solo instruments so it's very important that you have proficient players to be playing such things. And yes, the embouchure is different because firstly, the mouthpiece is way bigger than the V-flat clarinet. 
Yeah. So to play, in a sense, is the same, but it's very different as well. Yeah. So the basic concepts is still the same. Upper teeth on the mouthpiece, and for me, it's really a relaxed lower jaw. You just bite the upper teeth on the top of the mouthpiece, and then you just seal and just blow. That's it. Firstly, it's not a nice sound, but then from there you adjust. It's the same. Nothing changes. Yeah. So that's it. Short answer is different, but yeah. It, we don't have enough time today. And maybe VDA can have a second installment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I guess for auxiliary instruments, you should treat them as a new instrument. You should spend time with it. You should practice it as much as your B flat. You know, it, it's not something that you, you can just pick up and let's go, you know, play the E flat, play the bass. It's, it's something you really have to spend time to understand. It's a new instrument. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The finger technique is the same, but the playing, actual playing, is totally different. Yeah. yeah. And you should really have a fundamental in your B-flat first before proceeding on to the E-flat and bass. Because often you see a lot in the school bands where immediately set one, okay, you play the bass clarinet. And then they have zero control of their fingers and it's quite daunting. Like Kayla, I saw there's a question by Kayla that even after adjusting, you can't reach the lower notes. Can't reach because of your the short lower arms. Mm. I'm sorry if you have short arms, but you just have to make do with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because sorry, it is I'm quite sorry. it is quite a fast stretch. But for me, I have no issues. A lot of times, you will need to stretch your pinkies, the press. Yeah, so just be relaxed and try your best. Uh, yeah, and it's very important even though you're trying to press everything, try to pain manage because you have a lot of injuries if you're always stretching your pinkies a lot. Yeah, so if you have pains, please massage them out. Pain management is very important because once you have pains, you start hating the instrument and then it's a downhill battle. Yeah, and try to enjoy whatever you're doing. I hope that answers your question, Kayla. Actually, sometimes I see primary school students playing the bass clarinet. It's amazing how they can reach all those lower notes. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. They really stretch, go all out to stretch to reach yeah, the lower like... notes. Um, <laughs> to all the band directors out there, you are doing a really good job. Yeah. <laughs> tutors, clarinet tutors, yeah, yeah, doing a really good job. Okay, uh, and I think we have a lot of people asking. Um, yeah, I see. What exercises <laughs> and how to improve on their tone? So, Scales. would you guys like to... <laughs> <laughs> Scales. Yes. Long I tones. Think, uh, for, for me, very important, uh, expanding from long tones, is that you need to have a sound in mind first. Uh, even if we do long tones, but we, we don't have an objective, you want to use your ears. Is, uh, do I sound pinched? Do, is my tuning okay? You know, we, ha we have to do first. You want to get to know a friend better, you spend more time with a friend. There's like a hundred over mm. different friends here, very irritating. But you have to know every single one of them. And it's just by spending more time with them. Also by having a very good sound concept. You, you should know what you want to sound like first before you can improve your sound. You can't just wake up, I want to get better, but you have no, no, object, uh, no, no sound in, in mind. Mm. So yeah, long yeah. story short, there is no miracle for <laughs> sounding good. Spend the time doing long notes. Listen to yourself, record yourself. You are your best teacher. Mm. When you hear yourself, it sounds bad. Ask yourself why. And then when it sounds, uh, if it sounds good, what did I do today to make it sound better, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, we could we could show you long tones example now, but then that'll be the rest of the, the time. So <laughs> do your long tones with, uh, with recording. Yeah, I, I think I think I speak for everyone. Does anyone have anything to add on to long notes and sound? I think we all agree. Most important, we need to have a good sound concept. Yep, yep. Yeah. And of course, uh, if, if you have a, a, a mentor, uh, it, it's very good to ask for a second opinion as well. Yeah, someone yeah, else share your ears. 
And it's important when you do your long tones just to keep your embouchure the same. Don't as you get more tired and fatigue sets in, they start biting. You should always be relaxed and open. That's the most important. Yeah. We also have some questions on double lipping of the embouchure. Mm. How do you feel about double lipping? By uh, Trinity Chong. Yeah, I I I think double That's lipping right. is a is a very good way to avoid pinching for students who like to pinch the reed to make a sound, because when you double lip, what happens is when you start to bite, your upper lip also starts to feel the pain, and unless your tolerance mm. is very high, you know this will this will will force you to keep the jaw down. Yeah. Um. So, so for so sometimes I I do do long tones with a double lip embouchure, to ensure that I um I don't. I'm not pinching the reed to make a sound, but after that, after a while, I will I will go back to my uh, single lip. So, but yeah. again, there's also nothing wrong with with double lip embouchure. In fact, I think that's more traditional than what we are doing now. If I'm not wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think if you stand up to play double lip, it's going to be very painful. Yep. 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 Yeah. So it, just it, it be has, aware. Yeah. It has mm-hmm. to be natural. Natural. If if you pick up the instrument, and without anyone telling you what to do, and you play it like that. And I've seen some students, or rather, I've discovered some of my students. They're actually playing double lip, and I've never realized. And and I ask them if they it hurts. They say it's it's good. They feel okay. Yeah. In fact, when when my teacher was asking us to do it, uh, I I found that when you do double lip, the the oral cavity changes, and it somehow mm. it's much better, especially. I don't know for the high notes and everything. It doesn't feel so tight anymore, so you can experiment with it. Yeah. Uh, David, actually, you have pre- prepared a very nice drawing for us. Would you oh. want to use it to ah, explain yes. oral cavity? <laughs> ah, yes, yes, yes. And while David, while David is preparing, uh, just one, one other fact. Uh, let us make sure that our lower lips is tucked over our teeth. Okay. Some of us are playing with our lower lips hanging off, and there's no support there. All right, David. Okay. <laughs> nice drawing. So for my yeah, students on listening, beautiful. you have seen this picture about a thousand times already. Um, <laughs> so this is an example of how the mouthpiece should sit on the lower jaw. If you can't tell, um, I mean, I marked it out. The big thing, that, that, that triangular thing is the mouthpiece. You have your teeth, your lips, the flat chin. And I like to emphasize the little pointy end that you will naturally get when you have the flat chin. Okay. So uh, for reference, this is the upper teeth. Yeah, the upper teeth will rest on the top of the mouthpiece and that triangular bit is actually the, the lip that seals the mouthpiece, seals the air. It covers the, the basically the, the teeth. Uh. Okay, so, um, so actually this is more of a uh, tongue position, but also can be used for embouchure. So I'm going to talk about the low embouchure. This is for low notes. You see the tongue, is it, it is raised but it's not very high. Yeah, so these are for low notes, like your low E all the way up to maybe your throat B flat. Yeah. Low, uh, low tongue position. All right, and then we go on. I think just now we had a question from uh, Mr. Howard, I think about the A to B break. Because this is a very, very big break. Even though they are next to each other, it's a very big break because of the resistance due to the keyword. The tube from A is here. And then when you press, when you go to B, it goes all the way right to the bottom. So that's why there's that huge difference. So a lot of students, they start to bite. The jaw will move up in order to get that, to squeeze that B out, which is, of course, not, not good because the sound will change. So I will tell them to raise your tongue very slightly by saying, yu, yu, yu. So the tongue is high and it's forward, yu. So you, if you compare to the low one, you can see the difference. It's very slight, but it does matter. So you raise the back of the mm. tongue a bit more. So that's your clarion range. It's your clarion range. And then for altissimo, of course, you say E. And the tongue is very, very raised. Oops, sorry. The tongue is very, very high. That's, that's where you get the, 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 that's how you cross the break of the different uh, registers. So just to compare all the three tongue positions, you have low, you have uh, the clarion range, which is slightly higher, and the altissimo, which is the highest. Now, if you see, there's a similarity between all of these three positions.
positions. The jaw never ever moves. So for students who are trying to hit the high note, if you find that you have to move your jaw up so so much, you're probably doing something wrong with your tongue. Your tongue is the one doing all the work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, David. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, maybe yes. can you play the exercise again? But let us see your side view so that you know ah. the audience can have better view. Okay. Ah. Uh, so let me move to the side. Now, uh, so this is the low range. Um, I can't show you my tongue. But... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the low range. Okay. This is the clarion range. See, there's zero movement in the jaw. Many students, they do. You get squeaking because you don't let the reed vibrate naturally. So you keep the jaw down. So I don't know if my jaw is moving. I hope it wasn't. <laughs> so, if, so even in the altissimo range, your jaw still stays the same. But if you can slice my head in half and see my tongue, yeah, my tongue is doing all the work inside. That's why this is one of the hardest things I find to teach because. You can't see the student's yeah. tongue position. So you have to use, for band directors, you have to use vowels like uh, R, O, E, R, O. And it's important to say, to tell them that. Say A, E, I, O, U without moving your jaw or your lips. Because they'll just say A, E, I, O, U. And it's kind of different for the entire <laughs> purpose. So you attempt to hold your jaw down and make the sound A, E, I, O, U. And then they will realize, hey, my tongue is actually moving all over the place. And that's mm -hmm. what we want because the tongue is, <coughs> is the work for you. Yeah. So that's how for okay. autism for iron range here. Yeah. So uh, yeah. maybe, uh, maybe I'll demonstrate what will happen if I do not move my voicing. Yes, yes. yes. You can start to hear in this upper register, it starts to be a bit off a bit. Also then, some of you are the younger players, you have this problem where you... And this is a combination of things, but primarily it's in the in E. We need to raise our tongue. Uh, expanding from what David said, I think the vowel is very good because when you say A E I O U, you never does the tip of your tongue raise. Uh, some of our students we misconcept, and by by say when we say raise the tongue to a higher position, we think of raising the front. But actually, when you say A E I O U, it's the back of the tongue that does it. So as you go up higher. It's very, very open, and then you can't even get the sound. So yeah, yeah, uh, very important to have this training. And okay, so for me as well, maybe oh, yes. for the like beginning students, if you don't really understand the concept that we are talking about now, maybe you can just think about your air going in different directions. So normally our air is going straight from our mouth to the mm. mouthpiece, but. If you want a higher voicing, you can aim that almost like that. And then physically, internally, something will happen. Or if you go from a lower, if you just think about that, maybe you can experiment on your own and see what happens. Yeah, especially for the high C is the biggest issue for a lot of beginning clarinets, that it doesn't go high enough and it doesn't speak. So maybe you can think about it that way, where your air Maybe it's coming from the top of your mouth and then something happens to your tongue as well. Yeah. And what can help is really your air pressure as well. Just push a lot of air and see what happens. You don't have to play louder just because you push more air, but it's just faster air or more capacity of air. That's the most important. Doesn't mean we mm. have to play loud, high and soft for low notes. It can be super low and super loud and super soft and sweet on the high notes as well. So just think about that and just mix around your air capacity. Yeah, and there's also a lot of questions on how you articulate. It is always a struggle for clarinets to articulate. Yes. <laughs> yeah, even for play, after playing for so many years. And yeah, for me, the analogy is always when you turn on the tap, the water is always flowing. And then you just use your fingers to chop the water. The air is still constantly flowing. And then if you put your hand there, the water will spill and overflow. 
Yeah, but the air is constantly flowing. And then that's just, if you want a light articulation, you just slightly tap. And if you chop it up, the articulation also will change. Yeah, if you just chop, the, wa the water is still flowing. So just, just think of that as the air and see what happens. It's really difficult to explain such concepts through this because we don't know how you're playing. But that's the general mm. idea. Yeah, to just keep your air flowing mm. and then just to abrupt the air speeds. Yeah, and to form the different articulations. Yeah, not one staccato is the same for every piece. You also have to look at the yeah. context. Mm. Yeah, so you need to yeah. see what kind of music you're playing, what kind of style. Yeah, and then you have to apply the same concepts but play it differently. Yeah, that's the only advice we can give you through this short time. I think it's also important to note that the articulating is not a two-step action. Go to the tip and release. It's not a two-step action. It's actually a release action. So the tongue is already on the tip of the, the, the mouthpiece. Supply the air, but no, there will be no sound because your air is I mean your tongue is blocking the air. Once you release the tongue, the air just is immediate. It's like a laser. It goes it goes in immediately. And then to, 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 there was a question on how to make your staccato bouncier <laughs> and that bouncy, yeah. bouncy effect. On, on the autissimo range. Yeah, so if you remember my drawing yeah. just now of the, of the arched tongue. So our tongue this way, this way. So it's not a, it's not a punching kind of action. A lot of, a lot of primary school students do that. It's a release action. So to make that bouncy effect, release and, and, and put back. All this time, like what Daniel said, pushing the air through. So, so I'm going to blow, I'm going to push the air and stop the air with my tongue. There's no sound. Okay, now I'm going to release my tongue. To make the bouncy effect, I'm going to put my tongue back while pushing my air. I, I'm getting a bit of distortion. Uh, are the rest of you getting distortion or is it just me? Yeah. A little, a little. Maybe try a lower note, David. Lower note, uh, okay. So maybe uh, like a high or something. Uh. So my air, if you can hear my air sound, it's going, it is non-stop. Because I'm building up the pressure at the mouthpiece. So once I release, the air goes in straight away. Um, the movement, generally, we like to keep it minimal. But, uh, well, like the, uh, Daniel said, and you know, the different pieces will require different type of articulation, which means it will be different. Uh, but uh, so, for example, we have questions on Makato, uh, I'm assuming Makato, M-E-S-T. I never learned this. this. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to- accent, uh, staccato, tenito. So the teacher once told me, accent is not about the tongue. It's actually about the air. Okay. It's not really striking it so hard. You have to actually supply it with even more air. So instead of you get a very bad bad sound, you have to supply the air to get the accent. Uh, actually, shall I show the exercise? Since we are articulation already, shall yes. I show myself? Yep. And also maybe yeah. you can talk about some finger things as well. Yeah. While okay. you're doing this exercise. So uh, this is a very familiar exercise for all of us because uh, we were studying under the same teacher. So uh, this is not the entire exercise. This is just an example of the first few and the last few. Okay, so what we want, okay, if I can show an example, yeah, staccato. So we want to keep the air always flowing, always flowing. And my tongue is just going, Ta, 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 ta. I'm very minimal. I'm not hitting the mouthpiece. Okay. To experiment with, let's say, accents or tenutos. Let's say uh, the second bar three, the accents. Again, it's just about the air. You use the air to facilitate the tonguing, not the other way around. Next one, tenuto. I ask myself, is my air flowing? Am I am I stopping the air? Sometimes we do. You get the where 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 sound because we are always restarting our air, especially when let's say in some band music, a lot of runs, 
and we are panicking about the fingers. We forget about the air. Okay, so this is just an example of the, the, the exercises for articulation. Anything anyone wants to add? I also want to say that whatever exercises David is saying now, it can also be done on the bass or the E flat. Bass clarinet. <laughs> yeah, it's all the same. Yeah. Yep. So some of you were mentioning about your fingers, like how to train the fingers. <coughs> A tip is that the mm. fingers should never be too high. Mm. They should just be slightly above your keys. Mm. Yeah, like your fingers should never be flying, mm. flying around. Yeah, they, they should just really move. That's it. Yeah. Yep. As close to the keys as possible, but above the key. Yeah, you shouldn't be covering the keys at all. Yeah. Well, uh, if I may add on, in order to actually train that, that uh, accuracy. I like to tell my students to take it to the extreme level. So when they play a scale, I make them, you know, when they lift off the key, I make them, I make them, uh, make their fingers stay on the key, so they don't actually let go of the key. So they just compress and release, press, release, press, release. All this is for training, only for training. Okay, but after a while, you mm -hmm. they start to realize, hey, I, they, they actually train the precision of the fingers. Yeah. They actually train the precision. So yeah. I think. And your fingers should always be curved. Yes. It should never be straight. Mm. Yep. Yeah, so from the side, it's really just curved mm. and never too high. Yep. Yeah, close to the keys. Uh, by saying curve, uh, some students, they have this double joint, yeah? Uh, this is not the way. <laughs> when you double joint the finger, you lose control of this part of the finger. You need control until here. And that's why you can't run, that's why you can't keep squeaking. So you want to keep it this way. We use the tips. My nails are a bit long, la, okay? But you have to cut your nails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you use the, 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 as close as possible, the tip to cover the hole. The tip yeah. of your finger or the ball of the finger? Uh, the fleshy part, right? The, the fleshy part, yeah. Fleshy yeah, part. Yeah, yeah. The ball, yeah, okay. Not, not really at the I, tip, I, but I call it just the ball. Like the tip, then students will think it's like clawing the instrument. So we want to <laughs> yeah. avoid that. Yeah. Uh, you, you want to move your fingers faster, uh, practice scales. But while you're practicing yes. scales, it's very important to always feel. Don't just do the scale. You have to ask yourself, how can, uh, is my finger tense? The moment your fingers are tense, you can't you go... It, it becomes a bit unclear. But if it's relaxed, you know... Was that laggy by any chance? No, it's okay. Sounds okay. No. okay so, yeah. so you have to relax. I uh, don't know if you can. <laughs> <laughs> You feel don't like, extremely don't relaxed. Like yeah. That one leg, like, that one leg. Like, Too relaxed. Like, basically, long story short, <laughs> it should, it should, it should, but it should be as relaxed as possible. The more relaxed your fingers, the moment you start to go, oh my god, there goes that passage. That's that hard passage. It's SYF day. You know, I'm very, I'm very nervous. Yeah. I think I've been practicing six. Get four. Tense. The moment you let, yeah, the moment you let this thought goes inside your head, it's going to, it's going. You can't run anymore. You have to be like, even though you are performing, it has to be as though. You know, you're the most relaxed person in the world. Yeah. Uh, easier said than done, of course. Yeah. Uh, something for you guys to think about. Just now there was a question from Tia Yi. Is it possible to play the clarinet on the side? Bass clarinet, I think. Bass no. clarinet. Was bass clarinet? I, I think oh, it was during the bass okay. clarinet. Yeah. Okay. If it's okay to play at the side. Is that the question, no. Tia Yi? Yeah, because I, actually I, I noticed, you know, there are some, some models, the E flat. Uh, bass, the E flat bass. Yeah. It doesn't go all the way down. Yeah. So notice that the younger kids, mm. their hands are in a very ah, yes. position. Okay. Yeah. So, so, if you have only the E flat, so imagine I'm sitting now and the bass is in the middle, right? Yeah. If you want, you put the bass to the left leg so that there's space here so that you can use your fingers. Mm. Yeah. I mean, even if you want to put, this is my right leg now, if you want to put it at the side, also go ahead. As long as you don't cover the keys yep. on the same side, it's fine. Mm. Yeah, but if you're putting it in the middle, just lean it against the left knee so that you have space mm. to press. Yeah. And also just a, just a quick tip for maybe the band directors, when, if, you have, if you don't have clarinet tutors, if you have bass clarinet players, when you look from the side of your bass clarinet players, the bass clarinet should be straight or tilted forward. It should never be tilted like that. Because a lot of times you have students being too small and then they sit like that. Like, 
<laughs> and that's why the sound is like that. So if I if you can, you put it straight or you put it tilting forward. Yeah. <laughs> if it's too if they're too short because you have a low C bass, then sit on double chairs or piano stools or whatever to help. Yeah, mm. that'll be a quick advice for bass playing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, but because we, due to time constraints, maybe yeah. we can uh, let some students have some takeaways, like maybe you can recommend some daily routine regime, clarinet, since everyone is staying at home now during this circuit, circuit breaker period. Circuit breaker. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody is stuck at home and we can't go out, so yeah. why not use our time wisely to maybe practice our Skills. Yeah. Long if you have no like music, just now. do skills. Yeah. You um. can do long tones articulation. Sorry, just let me cut this. Yeah. So yeah. long tones yeah. articulations. You can do so much with just one scale. Especially for clarinets, we can do three and a half octaves for certain scales. Max out your range. Don't just stick to one octave all the time. Mm. Yeah, especially to our students out there. This is what we've been saying all the time max out the range because we have the range everybody should be comfortable playing this is not a high c there's a higher c even yeah so it's only high c because this is always your max yeah this is just a normal c to all of us <laughs> mm. yeah skills desmond would you like to share anything um some of the students asked about a good routine right i think like what daniel said mm. Uh, long tones for sure. A good routine will definitely have long tones, some form of technical exercises, be it scales or passage that you are working on, and then articulation. And uh, let's go back to long tones. You can also work on intonation during your long tones. Just placing the tuner there. Since you are playing one note, it's all right to look and check. And like David added on much earlier, to make a journal about your own clarinet, your own clarinet tendencies, that would help you a lot. So when Ben resumes, everything falls into place yeah, very nicely. Yeah. yeah. And some of you might not have tuners, but we all have a smartphone. So <laughs> there, there are a lot of free apps for tuners. Yeah, so there's no excuse for you not to have a tuner. Yeah. There's a free one called Sound Corset. Mm. Sound corset and it's mm. free, and a lot of our students use this. I think it just yeah just uh, and that's it. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, it's it's definitely cheaper than buying a a, a tuner if mm. if you tuner. can't afford it. Yeah, or a metronome. Yeah. There are some apps that have metronomes and tuners together. This is one app I use, uh, recommended by David. It's called um, <laughs> PE, PE Tuner, Tonal Energy, but it's not free. I think it's about four bucks or something, but it has everything in it. It has, it has the metronome, it has the tuner, it even has the sound. Yeah. <laughs> Let's try. Hashtag not sponsored. <laughs> not sponsored. <laughs> Okay, maybe uh, just one last point before we end off today's session. Um, uh, I think a lot of students, those very enthusiastic students, they are asking what are some of the possible path or school they can take on and what are some of the struggles or, you know, that you, you all face as professional musician. Maybe you can just share individually. Shall <laughs> <laughs> I? Shall I? <laughs> should, should, should. Yeah. Because... Should, we, should we start with the youngest? This <laughs> 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 is the newest to the industry. Okay, um, of course you have, uh, if you're talking about post-secondary school, you have to take your diploma first. Or, uh, if not, if it's post, if I'm not wrong, post-JC, which is A-levels, you can also take, you can jump straight to your degree straight away. Um, the two main, of course, the two schools that I know of is, um, of course, NAFA, uh, that offers diploma and degree programs, and uh, Yongsuto Conservatory of Music. Which is also a direct, which is a degree program. So, uh, well, I'm not going to compare. Okay, uh, but in terms of the attitude 
that you 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 take facing in school. You gotta understand that schools like these are not of polytechnics. They are not, you know, ah yeah, this class I skip lah. Ah yeah, that class I skip lah. I can just I can just scrape through the test. This kind of music arts institution is more of a progressive journey. As you know lah, you can't just practice for ten hours one day before SYF and expect it to be good. Not gonna work. It's a progressive thing. So you first things first, you gotta have the passion. You gotta strive to get better. You know, if you are a bit, ayah, a bit wrong, then my lah. Ayah, this one out of tune, then my lah. Then maybe, ah, uh, music school is not the thing for you. Um, you gotta be hardworking. I mean, being hardworking is an understatement. I mean, all of us will know. We are, you know, if mm. you 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 if you want to do well in music school, you got to put in the time. You got to put in the effort. The thing is, you must be ready to suffer. And you will suffer. There's no easy way out. You will definitely suffer. But when you suffer, that's when you know you are making your money's worth, or your parents' money's mm. worth. No, PSD. that's irony. You may suffer. You may get results, but it's not good enough. Mm. Uh, I'm just gonna yeah. be very brutally honest. Mm. Uh, to all of you who want to be a music student, if your goal is if if your goal is nothing to be better than the four of us right here, you shouldn't be a music student. Whoever I said to music school. Before I send her to music school, I will tell them, "Your goal is to be better than me, and my goal is to make sure that you're never better than me." Just <laughs> very bluntly putting it, that is the that is the amount of 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 hard work we have to go through. That one day I'm going to surpass you, and as a teacher, I'm not gonna let you surpass me. Yeah, you know, every day we have to work hard. Uh, I I think that's 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 my take yeah. on it. If you if you can't be better than me. Oh wow, that sounds very. Bad. <laughs> yeah. But but I'm gonna be honest with you. It's not an easy path. Please please never yeah. never choose music because it's the easy option. Yeah. There have been sayings like this every once in a while. Ah, you do music because it's easy. No. Oh my god, it's so damn difficult. Please, <laughs> do it only if you are willing to put in the hours. Like what David said, if you're willing yeah. to, to to suffer. Passion. What is passion? Passion is to suffer for the art form to make it better. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, and just because we are professionals, we doesn't mean we don't get criticized as well. Yeah, we are constantly, constantly being re- criticized. Constantly. Yeah, and we are always judging ourselves as well. Yeah. So this is one of the h- toughest jobs. Yeah, because we are always unhappy with ourselves. Yeah, and we can practice for many hours, and it during the performance we still mess up, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, yeah, it's something you have to. Money is not with. worth anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, Desmond. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. What you all said, everything it is difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. Tough. Yep. Tough. So think, consider it through. Think it really yeah. hard. If you want to do it as a hobby, by all means, we're all supportive of that. We support definitely. Mm. But to do it yeah. as a profession, it's, it's difficult. But yeah. very fun still. Very fulfilling. Yes. Mm. Yeah. It's fulfilling. Yeah. End of the day, we think, are doing what, think, what we like. Mm, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. At, at, like what I heard from all of you guys, I y'all y'all shared the very realistic uh, stories and experience, and with all those sufferings and struggles, I mean, you guys are still in this line, so I think that that says a lot, and uh, I just want to thank you now for 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 accepting our invitation to this session. <laughs> And uh, we have lots of, we have lots of unanswered uh, questions on <laughs> Actually, our, our comments is yeah. all flooded with questions. Yeah, yeah. We see, we so see sorry about comments. that. Yeah, we can yeah, so sorry answer about that. the questions offline on the same link. Yes, yes, yes. Do, yes yeah. If y'all don't mind, so just please you continue asking your directly. questions. Yeah. Mm. Yes, and I think Xia Yi and uh, Stan Lee, Stan Lee Sim, all these very good clarinet, experienced clarinetists, they are also sharing some pointers in the comments. Thank so do, you, thank if you. If you have time, please read through. Thank you, thank you guys. And I, I, on behalf of Band Directors Association Singapore, I really thank you guys for taking some time out. Thank us. you for having thank us. Thank you, thank appreciate you. Practice. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yes, practice yes, safe, hard, guys. What's your Let loose. Wash your hands, wash your face. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. See you around. Bye. Bye. Bye.